you know, we've got a, a pretty diverse feedstock. You know, if it was just wood chips, let's just say it was cedar or alder wood or, or you name it, you know, that'd be, uh, that would lack the diversity, right? And so we take in lots of landscape material and then it, and that, that adds to the diversity. Yeah. So all of like the box elders and citrus and whatever else. And then all the their, their greenery, I'm sure that helps a lot too. It does, yeah. So the landscape materials range from 120 to 150 to one. So that lowers that seed in ratio, so we can use less manure. We do with this. This is our, our woody. This is the the woody material that goes into the compost. Okay, so this is part of your secret sauce. Yeah, part of our, our recipe. You know, if the the common ratio is four to one, four brown to one green. Mm -hmm. right? and so we match the uh, C to N carbon to nitrogen ratio at uh, about twenty to one for this. On average, take about 80, 90 days. In the initial stage of the compost, as the piles get hot, you've got the thermophilic action, and so. Bacteria are the, the primary decomposers. Uh, once the temperature drops into the mesophilic stage, that's around 120 degrees, uh, that's when the fungi start to activate and start decomposing. 21 days of being thermophilic. So our piles are routinely, you know, around 40 days above 131 wow. Fahrenheit. Yeah. So we eliminate all pest pathogens, weed seeds. You know, it's really important to keep things free of pests or pathogens so the cows don't get mast uh, mastitis mm -hmm. or, or other bacterial infections. So this dairy is really pristine. Uh, we do an excellent job to keep all the cows extremely healthy and happy. Yeah, they seem pretty chill. We make our own compost. We use soil food web okay. uh, type compost and we have a, a mountain of it over here. Yeah, that's that's kind of the direction that I'm interested in going is just try to figure out. Like I was saying to you guys earlier, you know, everyone wants regenerative, but they don't understand like the components that need to be available so that that can actually happen. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So I'd rather make soil and support growers. Yeah. Uh, with an excellent product, so they can grow good, clean medicine. Uh, medicine and you know, medicinal crops and food. Yeah. Uh, take the guesswork out of it, right? Well, so. it's like anything that you're putting into your body. I mean, you want it to be as close to like as clean and natural as possible. Yeah, we just really try to to give the the customer the right structure. You know. Give a product that has the right soil structure with with excellent biology, and uh, you know, kind of check off all the boxes of what a good soil or you know an excellent soil is. I'll show you the uh, the forage. Okay. Farm. Yeah. So the the farm's got 160 acres. They grow forage, so alfalfa, rye, you know, that's the sort of triticale, <laughs> other fun stuff. The farm. Uh, Balanced all the soil minerals and uh, did a, a little pilot project to transition them to regenerative. Yeah. Now, on this field, this was actually the, the worst field. I was wondering if that was going to happen because I'm walking towards this green mass that's like clearly denser. <laughs> this is regenerative right here. This was conventional rye last year. Uh, and then now it's uh, alfalfa crop just got planted in September. Wow. When you planted it, you put in your mix. Like a soil, like a compost mix? Yes, yeah, so what we did is we used the compost, uh, calculated the, uh, there were some trace minerals that needed to come in, and then obviously we had to say obviously, but most soils need calcium, right? So we added, uh, gypsum and some agricultural lime to boost the, the calcium numbers in the field. 
That color difference, just that line of demarcation out there, is blowing my mind. Right. Because, like, you could see this was darker walking towards it. Mm hmm. But standing here looking back, it's like, holy cow. It's, you know, the, the minerals are not in the, the proper balance. You're adding conventional fertilizers that kill the biology. Yeah. So, you know, the biology makes the minerals plant available through mineralization. Uh, and that's what we're relying on here in this field. And we have some pockets that are a, a bit thin. Um, but this, the challenge in this field was just balance the minerals and leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Just let the, you know, the normal course of action, or you know, the, the farmers just do their normal thing. Getting close, yeah, getting close to another, another cot, yeah. You'll see it's, uh, it's in pre-flower. Right, so that's when the, the nitrogen levels are at the highest, uh, right before bloom, so. That's when you want to cut it. Mm -hmm. Then that impacts your compost. A compost or, or even the, the cow's feed. So the cow's, uh, the relative feed value is based on protein and, uh, and the, the level of nitrogen, you know, being the highest protein. The high nitrogen stage. Yeah, and this was the problem field. Now it looks great. It looks so great. Yeah. In comparison, like I love that you have that side by side to show because that's just that's kind of the stuff you ask for, you know? Yeah, and it was like you want to see visually. Very inexpensive to do. I think it came out to uh, fifty dollars per acre to do regenerative instead yeah. of it's conventional. Might be more expensive than that, right? It is. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That's actually good to know. <laughs> no, it's cheap. You just have to have, I mean, it's, it's such a blessing that the compost yard is 400 feet away. Yeah, it's like you can <laughs> basically see it from here to some extent. So this is a seven acre plot right here. So this seven acres, um, we used uh, 120 yards of compost to balance things out. And we added the minerals in with the 120 and then broadcast that out. And it was literally a dusting of, uh, you know, 120 yards yeah. on seven acres. Is yeah, that's not, like, it's not very much. Right. But that's impressive. If you can go that thin, mm -hmm. and so you dusted it with compost and yeah, minerals and then, uh, and then, and then disked and, it. And tilled and it seeds. in, yeah. Yeah, just to get it moving through the six inches of soil. Yeah. Because now you have root mass, mm -hmm. now you have like cycles back in action. And when we did it, actually what, what it, uh, the farmer did is I asked Ernie to let the um, the alfalfa stands grow out to seed or, you know, to uh, to bloom mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then plow them in. So he actually plowed in, we used a, a ripper, so okay. we broke up the existing compaction at 24 inches. So we ripped it and then uh, plowed the the biomass into the field. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think every field has got, you know, it's got issues with, with weeds, but you can see how thick the, uh, the alfalfa stands are here. Yeah. So. I know it's super dense here. I noticed when we were walking by the other ones that uh, it was a little more patchy in places. And here, it seems like the plant density is a little better. So it's just about figuring out protocol for the most part, for most people. I mean, there is an yes. input component, but also like what to do when in right. order yeah, to... Yeah, there's, there's the input component and then there's timing it. So let me show you another cool aspect I just thought of. Okay. So if you're in a field, uh, you want the ground to be sort of spongy. It's a little, a little wet, but you know, you can take your fingers in as opposed to Yeah. Some of that, that good old Texas soil. <laughs> One of the things that really drew me in about soil chemistry was that if you balance the chemistry of the soil and if you use the, the calcium to flocculate the clay, you can separate some of those, you know, that compaction layer mm. and allow for uh, the roots to penetrate deep down and do all of that work. Uh, the roots acting as, you know, a highway for 
for water infiltration and for the biology to, uh, you know, to, to create the free airspace that, that's needed. Well, if you have your, your calcium in the range of 70 to 80 percent, magnesium uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, potassium around 5 percent, uh, low sodium, and then you balance those the trace yeah. elements. Uh, what you do is you create an aerobic environment, and so you attract more of the beneficial biology, the earthworms, and all the other good stuff that, that needs to be there. Uh, and then you've got good crops. It's crazy how simple something can be if you understand the science behind it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. rather than just taking the conventional agronomist word for it because they're trying to sell the product or whatever. They sell so much product. And it's not, but it's not doing things that are good for the farmer or good for their land. Speaking of the farmer. <laughs> There's two ways we judge a field out here. I go by how many plants per square inch or square foot, and we go by cutting numbers. Theoretically, that field should have been taken out this year. There's not enough plants per square foot. We can actually put alfalfa on top of alfalfa, but we try to let it rest. So we're going to go with the lighter green field up there is rye grass. Okay. On the left. Yeah. And we try to keep our organic matter in these fields as high as we can. Plus we have the compost, so that's not an issue for us. That's the that's the rotation mm -hmm. crop. See the difference? Yeah. This is a grass, not a legume. How long ago was that planted? Less than 30 days. Okay. And once we get five cuttings off of it, then it's it'll sit until once the last cutting comes off, then we start running soil samples on it to see what has to be added back into the ground and then we match accordingly to what goes back in the ground. And how long will you run rye on it? Only for six months. Okay, and then you go back to alfalfa from there? No, then we let it rest, give it time, and then we take soil samples, and then we adjust the field, and then in, the, in September, October, we'll replant it with alfalfa. Oh, okay. It gives us about three months to adjust the soil the way we want it. I'm sure that saves you a lot of money and heartache yeah. <laughs> to get it right. Well, if you have the right organic matter, you can grow anything. Did you show our soil? Yes. Over in the yard? I got some over here. Because oh. I had a gypsum. We were lacking gypsum, so I put about 600 pounds to an acre of gypsum. That's grass. <laughs> Somebody else. No, I drove past like a turf farm. Yeah, that's what this is. It seems like such a strange thing to have out here. I mean, I know that you have the season for it, but the water side of the situation. Out of that, they, they take a lot of soil when they take it out. Ah, that's true, huh? Because it's all if connected. You, if, you, if you were to get an aerial view or a view of this land here from on top of one of these hills, you, you could see it. When it rains, they're all flooded, and we're not. Yeah, it's because you have the infiltration because you have. Well, they take they take what a quarter inch to a half inch of soil every time. Mm -hmm. Sod farms are the hardest ones on a piece of property. I don't even know. Some cities won't even let them lease the property. And see, the problem with planting, and you'll start to see it. I don't know if you're too familiar with auto toxicity. Mm -mm. Alfalfa plants make a, what would it be called, Paul? Where it makes it so, uh, like a hormone around itself to where another plant won't grow. Oh, it's allelopathic? Yep, allopathic. Allopathic? You never that, say that one right. <laughs> see, that's why, that's why you see the blotches of plants. Oh. 
And to get that out, you need to we deep rip and we let the soil sit for about a month and a half open. Then we start doing all our fancy composting and everything, put it into the soil then, and then close it back up. It seems to take most of it away. A lot of guys will overseed and it's a waste of money. Yeah, I think I've been one of those guys. Oh. <laughs> With cover crops in general, where you've just overseeded at the wrong time and didn't catch the window, right? If we do a fall planting, we don't ever do a spring planting. We just haven't had as much success. That makes sense though, because that's moving into your rainy season. And so then the well, plants we don't have that. We, we, we irrigate. It's 24 7 around here. Irrigation. Here's our top dressing right here. What did you bring over? I can't tell you, Paul. It's a it's a oh, it's pr pr proprietary uh, blend. <laughs> it's proprietary, Paul. This is stuff from the yard. Sorry, it's proprietary. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got a shovel in your car? Oh, uh, you know I don't, but I got hands. Proprietary. That's what we oh, use for top dressing. You guys been mixing minerals in without my knowing? Mm hmm. I know I should have told you it's proprietary last time. All right, it's prepared here. <laughs> Here's a perfect example of compaction right here. You can see? The tire track from where the truck came when we put the. Yeah. See how it goes through the field? It'll take two or three cuttings before that comes out. So you, say, you see uh, the immediate effects of the Yeah, that's good. Yep. I could show you a field right over there. The rabbits have eaten in probably 10 feet. <laughs> Looks like a lawn out there. <laughs> Which field is that? It's with one over there, C. Oh, C. We did see that. There was two bear spots. <laughs> no, we'll go back that way since yeah. we're pointing this way. So. And this field has never even been cut yet, so this one's planted. This is this one. this one. wow. So green. Organic matter. Yeah. If you balance your field, you're gonna, you can grow anything. This here is a new field. Right, you can start to see it as soon as we turn in here. You'll start to see the grass completely mowed down to nothing. See it? Oh see, yeah. See the difference from the fence to the... That's the rabbits? That's the rabbits. <laughs> Look how much they eat. I guess if you have them to say, you don't have to go searching for good food. Well, here, here's a problem. Here's a field that had palm trees in it. And look at There's still dead palm trees and everything lives on that side. Yeah. It comes over and eats on the green side. <laughs> what do you do? I don't know. This, heel, this field here, when Paul, Paul first showed up, we started doing some weird stuff over here, the experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's working out. Yeah, well, I've healed it since then. <laughs> Actually, we did just about everything we did before, except we added some gypsum to it. And that made all the difference? No, it didn't make all the difference. It, we just had to balance it. Uh. You're right, Paul. It's hard to get out of that sort of mentality of, okay, well, this is the solution. It's like, well, there's 15 things you need to do to get to the solution. Yeah, there's a lot of there you can really see. Oh, you can see it, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they we, mow your fence line. Yeah. But, I mean, we got owl boxes there. We got owl boxes here. The owls don't pick on the rabbits very good. They do on the gophers. Now, this field here was an experimental field, and it was only to drop the, uh, 
the lignin in the hay, and it didn't work. Or it's not, it's not coming out to the way we anticipated it. Oh, this lighter one? Yeah. See, our nutritionist tells us when to cut the, cut the field. A normal alfalfa is cut a third into the bloom to have, have the highest protein, the highest energy, everything. It has to be cut pre-bloom. We only have a couple day window in that when that plant comes to life to that stage. And low lignin is supposed to give you about five day window extra than this field. Mm. It's supposed to change the cellulose digestibility and all that into the it's supposed to be in the plant but it just doesn't doesn't come out in paper when you test it seems like the goal should be to just grow the healthiest plant you can you yeah know, so exactly digest it properly yeah right. rather than trying to engineer a, uh, but that's the science they're going to I, I mean could the dairy nutritionist are going to no, then it, no, that was that was a seed company. Oh. I was pushing that. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they can do to keep you buying. That's right. And do an improved low lignin. <laughs> Guaranteed unhealthy plants. No, with less plants. Well, that. It just didn't. It just didn't come out. It just didn't. For the cost of that seed versus what you could buy conventional seed for. Yeah. There's no no comparison. It's fully mended. We put uh, kelp, crustacean meal, neem meal, alfalfa meal, uh, biochar, basalt, uh, the compost cocoa. So, uh, one of the cool facts about compost is that uh, there's an estimated nitrogen release so the estimated nitrogen release is how much nitrogen uh, is available through organic matter. You get about 15 to 20 pounds uh, per acre per percent of organic matter. Okay. So if you've got a soil that's 10% organic matter you can, you can potentially grow potentially corn without organic. adding. Yeah you can estimate that you've got somewhere between 150 and 200 pounds of nitrogen that's available throughout you know, through a slow release yeah so are you making money with your youtube channel yet i make a little bit of money yeah there's enough to about enough a month to pay for gas driving halfway across the country so 